Right, good morning, everyone. Can I encourage people who are sitting to the outside of the room, can I gently encourage you to come and sit at the desk, around the desks here, around the tables here, so that we can feel like we're having a slightly more intimate conversation, although intimacy will be a little bit of a challenge in this room, but in this rather grandiose room. Um, welcome, everyone, to this morning's session where we're going to be discussing data governance for developing countries. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Stewart, and I'm the Executive Director of the Pathways for Prosperity Commission. We are a, a two-year commission based at the University of Oxford, looking at how developing countries can use digital technologies to deliver inclusive growth, to transform their economies. We're co-chaired by Melinda Gates, by Strive Masiwa, and by Sri Mulyani Indrawati, who's the Indonesian finance minister. Um, and I'm delighted to have you all here today. Before I introduce my panelists, let me just say a couple of words about kind of the process. Um, if you're tweeting this, and obviously we'd encourage you to tweet it, please use the hashtag, please, at P4P Commission. Please also, um, if you're watching this online, and good morning or good afternoon, depending wherever you are, very early in the morning to some people, uh, we'd be delighted to take questions from the online audience. You have two ways of sending us your questions. You can either tweet at us with the hashtag Digital Diplomacy, capital D in both instances, capital Digital, capital Diplomacy, or you can send a message, put a message in the chat box using Zoom, and if, it's, if it fits with the flow of the conversation, where the conversation's heading, we'll put this up on the screen and come to you. So, so two ways to to um, submit your questions. What we're going to be talking about today, I can't imagine that um, to anyone in this room it will be news to you that digital technologies are transforming economies, um, but also that they potentially, it's developing countries who stand to lose or gain the most by them. This is really an opportunity, this is a watersh watershed moment for developing countries, if they're able to use and take advantage of the opportunity of digital technologies, this could completely transform their economic um, development and their economic their development trajectory. But equally, this could go wrong. This could be something that entrenches and increases inequalities. And it's also going to be data governance that's going to be the thing that makes the difference, right? If we can get the data governance right, that is going to be the, what opens up the opportunities, these opportunities for developing countries. In our work at the Commission, at the Pathways Commission, we've uh, written this report, Digital Diplomacy, there are copies available by the door, where we've looked at the current state of um, regulation, policy making around uh, data governance. And we've shown very clearly that it's entirely dominated by the concerns, the priorities, the needs of advanced economies, if we want to use that term. Um, and unsurprisingly, the resulting frameworks that emerge from that are, let's say, at best suboptimal for developing countries. They just don't fit developing countries. And that's what we're going to explore in this session. You know, how do developing country policymakers deal with this dilemma that they're faced with these frameworks which don't fit them, yet there don't seem to be any alternatives. How can developing country policymakers balance the need to govern their data, to manage emerging risks, but also make sure that um, innovation is, is supported in their countries? So to explore these questions, I'm delighted to be joined by, um, to my far right, Kamal Bhattacharya, who is uh, one of our commissioners. He's also CEO of an edtech company, Mojo Chat, and he's former Chief Innovation Officer of the Safaricom iHub in Nairobi. Welcome, Kamal. Um, next to Kamal is Mariana Valenti, who is Director of the Internet Lab in Sao Paulo in Brazil, and she works on internet regulation um, and uh, policy and regulation. And then next to me, Delighted to have Fabrizio Hoschild, who is the Special Advisor to the UN Secretary General with responsibility for overseeing the UN implementation of the high-level panel, their high-level panel on digital cooperation, which I should say Melinda Gates was also co-chair of. She's been very busy in this space this year. 
Let me turn first to Kamal, if I may. And Kamal, can I ask you to share some of the findings from this digital diplomacy report? What, what is it that developing country governments reported finding in the space? What are their difficulties? And what were some of the solutions that, the, that, that are being suggested? Sure. Um, thanks, Liz. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good morning. My name is Kamal Bhattacharya. I'm very impressed, by the way, about this translation thing here. It's like this, this, you know, they, they usually suck, but this one is really good. <laughs> See, it says they usually suck, but this one is really good. <laughs> you know, that's, that's really cool. So, <laughs> it, so I shouldn't swear. Well, I should, and see if it's just, really good. <laughs> you know, I, I have to get more comfortable to swear, but you know, God knows. Like, we um, can move on to swearing later on in the session. <laughs> In any case, um, you should definitely pick up the, the, the great paper here on uh, digital diplomacy. I thought uh, it was a very interesting piece of research that the Pathways uh, Commission has done. Um, you know, I want to point out sort of three broad issues that came out of this research study. The first one is, um, is really around the importance of economic development for every policymaker and developing economies. Um, obviously, policymakers right now in developing economies are mostly concerned about how to make use of digital technologies and ICT at large uh, to drive economic development, to drive their development agendas. Um, it is, of course, so jobs and skills are top priorities. What I think where we have a lot of confusion is how do you use the current trends in technology to actually drive economic growth and at the same time have the right kind of regulations in place that support that locally at a country level or at the regional level um, without necessarily over-regulating it to such an extent that especially small businesses can thrive. Um, Realistically speaking, it comes to the second point is how do you implement these, re um, these uh, regulations? And the truth is, of course, that today the regulations around data, they are um, monopolized by the United States, by China, and by the EU. And in the EU, for example, you know, GDPR is um, you know, a, an interesting starting point. But I think what is happening in developing countries right now is a little bit of a, of a misconception, which is if you, if you tell people that data that uh, pertains to local citizen has to be processed in countries, the expectation is that the big multinational corporations will come into the countries and set up data centers to do business there. That unfortunately is going to backfire because it's nonsense from a technology perspective, and I don't think it is very meaningful from a regulatory perspective either. But you see the current G20 discussions around India and South Africa and others, and Brazil who are kind of pushing back on this, but I think it's completely beyond the point and the, the, the challenge is much deeper. And I think from a democracy perspective, the challenge is really around our future understanding of the word consent and whether consent is even a viable legal notion of the future. Um, we have to solve a much harder problem, but you know, this is of course then to the third point, um, which is are developing economies, especially in Africa, where you have a lot of um, countries with very small markets, even in a position to create their own um, governance and compliance mechanisms? Um, the answer is probably not, and the answer will always be some kind of a copy and paste to whatever model is deemed the right one. So it could be the Chinese model, it could be the European model. Now, that doesn't make the model right, um, for example, for Kenya or for Nigeria. Um, these kinds of uh, themes probably require us, um, require developing economies to form local clusters um, both from an economic integration perspective but also from a regulatory perspective around data um, to understand what is the right regulatory framework, for example, for East Africa or for West Africa. 
Pan Africa is still a few generations out, but you know, for all of these different regions, you know, what are the the future visions for how to regulate these three things? So um, I think these were some of the three um, things that stand out. Um, I encourage you all to read the report. I think it has a lot more very interesting data um, on this particular topic. Thank you. Thank you, Kamal. And just to add to that, in terms of the data, so it was based on a survey of just over 100 policymakers, academics, um, think tanks, civil society, and private sector in developing and developed countries. So that there's, there's, some, there's some primary data in there as well, so it's worth looking at. Let me, let me turn, Mariana, to you. So um, Kamal was just saying, you know, push back from Brazil. We were just talking a little bit about kind of contemporary developments in Brazil around this. How does this resonate? How does what Kamal has said and what our digital diplomacy report says, the findings there, how does that resonate with your experience in Brazil? What is it, you know, uh, how, how are you, how are you um, realizing that power imbalance? What does that look like from, then a, from a, a MIC perspective? Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Kamal, for setting the stage for this discussion. Um, well, I think one of the things that's most interesting in the digital diplomacy paper is to show how there's a lack of evidence-based policies in many of the developing countries, and that's the case in Brazil as well. And it often happens that some of the solutions found elsewhere, like in Europe or the United States, uh, is just understood as policy that's also going to work locally. But I think more, even more seriously than that, uh, solutions that are being found in the international uh, law and becoming binding to developing countries are not necessarily also happening in the interest of developing countries. Uh, so one of the examples for that is uh, international intellectual property, which since the 90s have been go has been going through a tendency of maximization. And that has been happening in different levels. So for example, uh, the first big example was the TRIPS uh, agreement uh, at the WTO, but then trade agreements as well. Um, all these negotiations, they have been leading us to higher intellectual property levels under uh, the argument that that's going to be good for development necessarily. Uh, and usually uh, there's a causality bias in this discussion because it will be said that developed countries uh, have uh, better development in digital technologies because of intellectual property. When, when you look at the history, uh, actually it hasn't been actually like that. And it has been the case that in Brazil and in many developing countries, these very high uh, levels of intellectual property protection, they have been hindering education and research, for example, which of course are uh, very essential to development, but also technology transfers. Um, and one thing that's happening at the international level now, which feels very concerning, is that in different trade agreements or in the e-commerce uh, um, treaty that's being discussed at the WTO, there's discussion on further protecting algorithms and source codes with trade secrets, which is a kind of intellectual property. Uh, and that's setting even a higher level of protection, whereas we, what we should be speaking of, of course, should be uh, open and free software if we're really thinking of how to make data uh, work for developing countries, right? Uh, that's one thing, and I think another thing that's really important when we're thinking of uh, inter uh, international policy making, but also policy making in the north that ends up having uh, results in developing countries, we also have to think that when we're speaking of digital technologies, extraterritoriality becomes uh, a de facto um, uh, standard. Uh, for many policies, so for example, even in the field of intellectual property, for example, uh, since the United States established the DMCA and because most platforms are headquartered in the United States, um, all countries in the world are able to be affected, maybe are affected by DM, the DMCA, and that's the case in Brazil. You can file a DMCA report 
uh, from Brazil. I don't know if everybody's understanding what the DMCA is, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. It's an act uh, from 1998 in the United States uh, that determines the regime through which a platform has to comply uh, with uh, copyright notices um, in order not to become liable for third-party content. And what I was saying is that we're able to use this US regulation directly from Brazil uh, to take down content from, uh, from international platforms, especially US-based. And that uh, leads us to the question as to how far are we able to really regulate uh, intermediary liability from Brazil concerning our own interests in this area, right? Uh, Brazil had a very interesting model of intermediary liability set in place in 2013. Maybe you've heard of the Marco Civil da Internet. Um, you might want to explain what that is. <laughs> the Internet Bill of Rights. Um, it's considered very interesting because uh, it's a law that centers around citizens' rights uh, instead of criminalizing citizens, which was more or less the standard of the discussion by then in Brazil and many different countries. Uh, and it sets a few standards for citizens, but also for the private sector. It's also aimed at thinking of developing uh, uh, the digital sector through guaranteeing a, a few protections for uh, companies and for citizens. Anyways, there is a good discussion to be made on intermediary liability and how that affects the development of digital technologies in developing countries. But the fact is that the intermediary liability regime developed in the US is being directly enforced in Brazil if we're just able uh, to use that from our ground. Yeah. So I'll leave it there. Okay, no, we'll, 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 but we'll come back to that because it's, I mean, it's fascinating that this is a, li you know, a live policy discussion as we're, as we're talking right now. Fabrizio, let me turn to you. And now you have the not inconsiderable task of <laughs> overseeing implementation of at least some of the, or at least the UN's contribution to the recommendations that were made in the high-level panel final report earlier this year. Can you talk to us, so the, the recommendations as they relate to this question of data governance, what, is, what, what realistically can the UN do to help resolve the kind of dilemma that we've just heard Mariana and, and, and Kamal talking about? No, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. And as you pointed out at the beginning, we're a little bit joined at the hip because we, we share a co-chair, Melinda Gates, and I think that also ensured that the work um, done by the high-level panel was very complementary and hopefully mutually reinforcing of the work you're doing. But given the, the intimacy of this room, of this small room being among friends, I, can you indulge me for a minute? Because to be honest, I share Kamal's fascination with this uh, tool. So you'll know this, but I just want to try this out. D does everybody know what a tongue twister is? No, does anybody know? So let's try this one. She sells seashells on the seashore. Oh my God. Okay, let's try a bit faster though. She sells seashells on the seashore. Now this, I must say, this is another um, Google DeepMind beating Go moment. Huh? I mean, uh, you know, technology triumphs once again over humanity. Anyway, and that's what this debate is a little bit about, I'm afraid. Um, no, I think we very much share the analysis. What we're seeing is that <clears throat> rules adopted in the more developed countries de facto um, uh, uh, governing um, um, processes in less developed countries in ways that are uh, often uh, unconducive um, to, their, to their needs. Um, and and uh, mention has already been made um, of uh, the US Cloud Act, the EU GDPR, the European Commission's Convention or European um, uh, Council of Europe's Convention 108. Um, and these are all um, approaches to data that 
um, are designed for the needs of, of the North, but de facto are imposed um, on the South without adequate um, uh, recognition of issues around intellectual property, as Mariana explained, um, without um, a recognition of the particular development needs um, uh, of the South, uh, and without um, uh, recognition of the value of, of, of data and the potential for data mining um, from uh, the, the, the South. Um, as, as Elizabeth said in her opening remarks, this is particularly critical because the, the issue of how countries, or I would add um, the speed at which countries adopt connectivity, will be critical um, to development. And the fact is that the trend at the moment um, is more towards inequality than towards equality. Uh, connectivity in the, least, um, in the 47 least developed countries is under 20%. Um, so, uh, how, with those sorts of figures, can you imagine it becoming a boost for development? The truth is, with those sorts of figures, compared to um, connectivity levels um, in, in the European Union, for example, of well over 90%, um, in China, of close to 90%, um, uh, it's those who don't, who, who have around 20% uh, or under, are literally left behind. Uh, in, the, in the place I worked immediately being appointed in New York, the Central African Republic, um, the connectivity was literally around five or six percent. Um, so how can you talk um, of internet um, being a boost to economic development uh, when you have connectivity levels of five or six percent? What it in fact means is that um, as other countries race ahead, um, the distance to catch up becomes ever more insurmountable. And how data is handled is just one indicator of that. So what can we do about it? I mean, I think the panel doesn't go into any detail on data management. But what it does make very clear is that there needs to be much more equity in say um, around um, what everybody, um, uh, the, the people in the developed world are the first to argue, should be a global tool. Um, and I, I think there's a, there's a fundamental contradiction we need to overcome between this notion um, that uh, the, the North is, is the first to uphold, that we want to maintain internet and the benefits it brings as a truly global tool. We don't want to see walls erected in, in cyberspace. We don't want to see a fragmentation of the net. And yet, at the same time, we have a very limited number of countries around the table when it comes to rule setting um, and, and governance. Those two are mutually incompatible. Um, I think to the extent that a uh, greater number of countries are not brought into the debate, um, the, the reaction will be more and more to have sort of knee-jerk, sometimes unsophisticated reactions um, of, of protectionism that, that can range from trying to erect cyberspace, uh, walls in cyberspace, to uh, simply shutting down uh, the internet. And of course, that's highly undesirable, um, but not being at the table um, is, uh, contributes to the sentiment that can lead to such extreme uh, measures. So I think the way, you know, the, the, what um, we discussed at length in the panel is that there's also a need for capacity building at a, at a regional and sub-regional level um, to make it possible for more engagement um, in international fora. And that's where the idea came from that is um, one of the central ideas in the panel report of regional help desks. And some of us were, why regional? Isn't that, um, isn't, wouldn't it be much more cost effective to boost existing global efforts? And there are a number of efforts from the World Bank to the ITU uh, and many others um, to build capacity um, in countries. Uh, and we, we welcome, the report acknowledges and welcome those efforts, but says that they're really not to scale um, and they're not localized enough. And that, hence the idea of having regional um, capacity building um, mechanisms that could take into account in a much more nuanced, sophisticated 
and sensitive way particular country concerns, particular community concerns, particular regional concerns, and help empower countries, communities, and regions to play a role in the global debate. Um, you know, this we'll see, this is one of the recommendations in the report that um, has raised a few eyebrows and that we're having some difficulty in finding champions um, for. So it's not entirely clear whether this recommendation will flourish. Um, but we believe um, both boosting um, efforts at capacity building and policy formulation and doing it at a, at a regional or even sub-regional level um, is the best way to address um, the sorts of concerns that are so um, uh, brilliantly analyzed by the Pathways to Prosperity um, report. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, Fabrizio. And um, as you say, there's a cl clear synergies between this idea of regional help desks and the idea of regional collaboration, cooperation as being a negotiating modality that looks like the most promising option for developing countries at the moment. So again, we'll, we can come back to all of these issues later, but I want to open it up to the floor now for questions about any of these topics. Um, I'll take questions in a couple of groups. Could I ask you to give your, obviously use the microphone, give your name and your organization, and if you could keep your questions succinct, please, because we'd like to have time for a couple of rounds. The lady over here. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Ingrid Volkmer, uh, University of Melbourne, um, and I'm heading an initiative called International Digital Policy Lab. My own background is in globalization and political public communication. Um, I, when we talk about these statistics in developing countries, I think it would be good to think about the tremendous drive of young citizens in countries. So the 20% uh, rate of um, having a, a, a mobile phone access is, is, great, is important, of course, but it's slightly misleading because in these countries we have young people, 50% of the population often young people, and they are the drivers of the economy in the future. And I think perhaps it would be good to also think about policy frameworks for these young citizens, how they can participate in the global digital economy in the future. I think that would be really important. And I, from my own academic work and from my experience, I've worked with the OECD and other organizations as well, there is not enough emphasis on this, I feel. The second one is that cities in these countries also, they are hubs for digital. And I think a bit more focus on city development. I've done just research in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, and we see clearly how Dar es Salaam is emerging as a local center. So that's one. Uh, and the second comment I would like to make can is... I, can I ask you, you make another question rather than a comment? Okay, another question. Well, there we go. Uh, I feel often we look at consumers, but I think in today's world, consumers and citizens merge. And we don't have enough understanding how political public communication, how democratic public spheres are constituted in developing countries. We have this wonderful Habermasian paradigm in the Western world, but there is nothing similar for other countries, and that's often misleading. That's why they are labeled as authoritarian countries, and et cetera. That's it. That's Excellent. Thank you for that. Let me take a couple of other questions. The gentleman here. Yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Jimson Olufuye from uh, Nigeria, former chair of the Africa City Alliance. Well, I just want to correct an impression I had, you know, when the Kamau was speaking, uh, saying the idea of uh, uh, localization or policy of localization of data that uh, to bring in a DC, a data center uh, establishment in country that is uh, nonsense. Oh, oh, well, that is from big companies. Well, I, I don't think uh, the statement is uh, overly correct because in Nigeria, uh, the data protection uh, regulation has actually spoiled a lot of local activities. Uh, the, there are local entrepreneurs that are setting up data centers in-house. And you know, the Nigerian economy uh, has 13.8% uh, contribution from ICT, okay? And penetration is close to 60%. Broadband is about 33%. So uh, just to correct that, that, if big players don't come in, the local player are up to the game. And that links up to the idea of uh, the need for us uh, to have a global framework when it comes to data governance. 
Uh, we have, as I said, there is Nigerian data protection regulation right now, uh, which kind of uh, dovetail from maybe GDPR, so uh, with some um, uh, possible uh, authorization for data to be hosted overseas, okay? So there has to be kind of a synergy. Uh, but a question I want to ask uh, Mariana is, um, regard to Brazil uh, concerning the intermediary uh, liabilities, uh, so are they really liable? Uh, is there a law that makes them liable in, uh, in, uh, in, in Brazil? And if I may ask the last one to our uh, special advisor. Uh, so I, I th thank you for the brief, uh, but the question is, uh, how do we uh, really move towards ensuring that we could have a global framework uh, that could uh, now help to streamline the issue of data governance regime uh, across the world. I think at that top level, it will help a great deal. Thank you. Thank you. And could you repeat your name? I'm sorry, I missed your name. Yeah, Jimson Olufuye. Jimson, thank you. E excellent questions, thank you. Um, Elizabeth, I'm, I'm, there are sort of comments, um, but I think it is useful to bring um, some additional um, commentary before we take some of the discussions. So I am going to, but they, they, they are also questions because I think they respond to some of the. We'll so, imagine a question mark at the end. We'll add our own. <laughs> I, will, I, I just wanted to say, you know, respond to some of the kind of assumptions about the conversation that we're having, and the sort of references to, to evidence-based policy, and even the important reference to the to the lack of connectivity. Um, but just to say that you know the, 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 the information that we have within the ITU system, and that is extremely. Sorry, let me yeah. pause you there. Did you, did you introduce yourself? I, I probably didn't. I'm terribly sorry. Um, my name is Alison Gilwald. I'm from um, Research ICT Africa, which is an Africa-wide um, think tank, policy and regulatory uh, digital think tank, um, and the University of um, Cape Town's Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance. Um, so we've been working over decades with um, various bodies within the region, various governments within the region, and of course within these um, regional economic communities. Um, currently working on um, digital economy model law with the SADC Parliamentary Forum, um, data protection with SADC, et cetera. So um, it's kind of in this context that I want to speak about some of the assumptions that um, cause some of these initiatives to fail because you, there's a kind of normative conflict, there's a normative dilemma, less so in SADC than in some of the other regions. Um, so kind of assumptions of democracy, assumptions of you know, competitive markets, and consumptions of, of not only connectivity, um, but also of you know, what connectivity means, post-connectivity issues that really affect the ability to get economic growth, et cetera. So, I mean, the first thing I wanted to say is that we, you know, we speak about the need for evidence-based policy. We actually don't have that evidence in Africa. We don't, we don't know where we are in terms of the you know, SDG, um, ICT targets. Um, so we, all we know is we're not gonna reach them, but we actually have no idea. The um, supply side data that's used within the UN system, we know doesn't measure prepaid mobile markets, which were predominant markets in these, uh, um, you know, in these countries. And it certainly can't do the kind of policy disaggregation that you need around income, gender, et cetera, et cetera. So we have very limited data. And I just sort of do feel obliged to make the point that one of the big um, disruptions to digital development um, on the continent at the moment is around the sort of, you know, um, hype around the fourth industrial revolution and technology that has actually um, distracted policy makers and, and, and implementers from you know, the challenges they have around broadband plans and things, and everybody's now sort of focusing on the disruption um, of, of, of artificial intelligence, donors, you know, every, all governments now have fourth industrial revolution commissions, and everybody's forgotten about actually the as you point out, the vast majority of Africans are not, are not connected. But I just wanted to make, sorry, the other point, because of the importance of this in, the, in, in terms of kind of getting economic growth and that, is that you know, the connectivity is obviously a big challenge still in large parts of, of the continent. Um, but it's not, so, you know, it's not largely a supply side challenge anymore. Many, many, many of the countries actually have, you know, 
80-90%, at least 3G um, co connectivity, but actually, as was pointed out, you know, far less than 20% connectivity. And some of the poster children of, you know, of the multilateral agencies and the banks, um, like Rwanda, for example, very strong supply-side measures with less than 10% internet penetration in, um, in, in, in 2018, and in fact, the biggest gender gap of 60%. So, you know, clearly, the, the, there's a lot more than just sort of, you know, supply-side um, kind of driven connectivity issues. And then in the data environment, you know, the real challenge in this digital inequality paradox is not just that as we connect people, we're leaving people behind, but actually the kind of connectivity that we're getting means that there's a big gap between those people who are barely online for a few minutes just to get some data and those who are, you know, really involved in, in, in extensive things. So I just want to say this is a kind of, before we even get into the questions of what's working um, at, in terms of, you know, data governance at a, at a continental, at a regional level, we're also working with the, with the AU, but also the, the real challenges around sort of mat multilateral um, endeavours in this regard that are, you know, um, they're basically failing because of these normative disjunctures that we're seeing on the continent. But I'll just keep it there this summer. Thank you very much, Alison, for that very um, useful and sobering corrective of, you know, what's the, what's the reality of, uh, on the ground that we're talking about? So that, that was very helpful. Let me turn to, in, in terms of sort of picking up on these questions, actually, let me turn to Fabrizio first, if I may. And <clears throat> maybe you could pick up on Jameson's point, but also what Alison just said about, you know, how, how, do, how do we deal with this conundrum of multilateralism? Uh, I mean, particularly, you know, a couple of elephants in the room, but let's talk about the role of the US. How, how, do we do, how literally can we do this when you have the US playing the role that it's currently playing? What's our, what's our roadmap to solve this multilateral conundrum and what can realistically the UN do? Okay, thank you. I mean, I think both Ingrid and Alison made eloquent points about the lack of reliable statistics. And in fact, this is one of the recommendations also of the high-level panel, that we need to get much more detailed data um, about exactly where exclusion is, is happening. And I would agree with Ingrid's point that if we look at youth, um, probably there's a higher proportion of youth, maybe through prepaid mechanisms, connected in urban areas um, of least developed countries um, than the, the statistics I quoted um, reflect. But let's recall that um, uh, in, in, developed, in the least developed countries, about 65% of the population is rural um, and connectivity is seldom um, goes out of uh, uh, um, urban um, areas. And I think to look at connectivity statistics on its own is also you know, a little bit misleading. Again, coming back to the Central African Republic, because I happen to serve there, um, the literacy rate among women, is a, and that is a reliable statistic, unlike some of the others, um, is 24%. So you can get 90% connectivity and you'll still be leaving 80% um, of women behind. Um, electricity connectivity, which again is a reliable statistic, is around 13%. So um, yes, you can have solar panels, etc. cetera. But um, you know, we need to look more holistically um, at needs. But the truth is current trends are widening the gulf, um, I think, between um, north and south. Yeah, or, or North and South is a bit misleading, but between the least developed and the most developed countries. Um, and that needs to be addressed. And one part of that, as both Alison and Ingrid highlighted, is getting a much better grip um, on, on, on the figures and their, their breakdown. In terms of Jameson's point, how can we address this? I mean, it won't come as a surprise that I'll answer, I think the UN is the forum to have these discussions. Uh, if we want truly universal um, instruments, we need a truly universal fora, and that is um, the United Nations. I do think it also has to be a multi-stakeholder discussion, and that in the United Nations is not always uh, easy, but this IGF is one UN-supported, UN-sanctioned body that is um, multi-stakeholder. Um, but we need also to drive towards concrete outcomes, which this body um, um, still lacks, and so hence also the recommendations of the panel for an IGF pass. 
Um, I mean, I, I don't want to address the stances of any individual country, um, but I think, you know, if enough smaller countries take up the baton of arguing for, for greater inclusivity, um, you know, I think their, 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 their voice will be heard. Um, I don't think anybody in a, in a hugely interconnected world um, can afford um, to ignore um, uh, two-thirds um, of, of the world. So I think it's about a better coordination of voices um, among um, developing countries around their interests um, in this domain. Uh, and we'd hope very much that the IGF can be a little bit repurposed to help facilitate that. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. And I should just add that um, we, as the Pathways for Prosperity Commission, we wrote a report a few months ago called Digital Lives, where we looked at these issues of inclusion and starting to move towards, think about some sort of possible solutions and possible business models for better, not just connectivity, but relevant, appropriate connectivity in a way that's useful for people who are currently excluded. But let me, Mariana, let me come to you because um, I, I really like the way you framed the dilemma of this question on data localization, which is one of those sort of balancing acts, which is very complex in this space. And you, you had a specific question for Mariana on Brazil. Yeah, I think Jimson's question for me was regarding liability for intermediaries, right? Um, and uh, he was asking if we have a, a liability regime in place and if companies are liable at all, they are. Um, but the way this was discussed when uh, this law that I was mentioning, the Internet Bill of Rights, was enacted in 2013, it was in a way uh, so as to take values into consideration and balance different values in the digital environment. So what got enacted was a regime in which, in most of the cases, platforms are liable after uh, a court order or during takedown of content. And that was, at least at the moment, worldwide celebrated as being a regime that uh, takes care of uh, freedom of expression. The issue is that, at that moment, it was impossible to come to terms also with the entertainment industry to have a regime for copyright. And I think when we're speaking of copyright, other issues also uh, come forth, uh, which is a balance in different industries and how you want to use that kind of policy uh, to develop uh, uh, different industries in your country, right? So like the, the entertainment industry or the tech industry. And for that, we don't have a rule. And when I said that the, the US rule is being directly applied to Brazil, uh, it also has to do with that. There's no specific rule for copyright infringement. And we've mostly been using the US framework because of platforms. Can I just really quickly pick up uh, on what Alison was saying, because it really resonated to me as well, um, that we're at this point really discussing uh, different policies for the developing world. And I think if, if I got right what you're saying, uh, I completely agree that, uh, at least in Brazil, but I also think that international fora, um, connectivity has become not so, not so much of a sexy issue anymore, right? And we're discussing many issues like regulating artificial intelligence, for example, right? That's like, or, or disinformation, which are all very relevant. And I don't think there's like a scale of relevance in terms of, no, in, in developing countries, like we only have to be discussing connectivity because we don't have enough connectivity. But it really feels that when we're discussing policies for the developing world, perhaps we would have to take a more holistic approach, right? And take all these issues into consideration, not leave connectivity behind, because it's clear that this is like in the basis uh, of everything that we're discussing here. And then uh, not just connectivity, but other infrastructural issues. So for example, many of the services uh, uh, in Brazil, they're not available to everyone because of payment systems, for example. So like uh, we really need that bold, plans, right, which don't just take into account like specific yeah. sectoral considerations. Yeah. 
Uh, absolutely, we'd agree, and we call these the digital foundations. So what are the, the, what are the things that you absolutely need to have in place? And then you need to build your data governance regime on top of that. But it's no point having a data governance regime if you don't have these basic things in place because there's not going to be anything to, to, to govern, basically. Kamal, let me turn to you, and obviously feel free to pick up on any of the questions, but I wanted to just pick up on Ingrid's point about cities, and you know, not least thinking about... You know, it's very cliche to say, oh, what is the role of the private sector in this? But there are emerging examples of public-private collaborations in this space. And it'd just be really interesting to hear you reflect on what's, you know, what can we learn from those? Is that, is that you know, what does the solution look like from that perspective? Uh, sure. I <clears throat> want to just first address my friend from Nigeria. You know, I think we have to be careful uh, this hope of data centers is a fallacy because data centers don't create that many jobs. The businesses that you build on top of data, they're pretty powerful. And they, I think they're kind of the future of what the digital society is. Um, and I've helped a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, both in Nigeria, by the way, as well as in Kenya and in South Africa, uh, to think through setting up local data centers. One of the issues is always that building a local data center in a developing economy is always expensive because of electricity, because of cooling, um, and because you have to build a double backup to a double backup, you know, to make sure the damn thing doesn't go down, right? So, so this is where, where my thing is also, you know, and, and the, the, the other example that I always give people is that, you know, the, the latest big trend in technology, especially in cloud technology, is something that is called serverless. Whatever that means, just think about the word, right? So what it essentially means, philosophically speaking, is that we're thinking about a future where the physical entity that does compute or storage, for that matter, um, is borderless. That's the future, right? And that was the future of the cloud already. So the implications of that is, you know, I kind of want to regulate um, something else, right? I want to regulate uh, the companies that are getting or that are already monopolies. I don't know what I can do about consent, but I know that Nigeria has a tough chance in the future to establish really valuable data businesses that go global, because there are already global monopolies in play where the borderlessness of data is going to be an incredible challenge for Nigerian companies to compete. And Nigerian companies are technically always extremely competitive, right? But when you see the, the, the hindrances that we have because of the way how private sector operates today, private sector that is focused on sort of this, this data economy, it's crazy, right? And that's what Nigeria needs to do other than getting to mobile money instead of bank-driven stuff and all of the infrastructure issues that you have outside of the things, right? But that's a longer discussion. I, I just want to point out one more thing on the role of private sector, you know, and, and also the role of, of connectivity. You know, we've, we've been doing, and unfortunately, you know, we haven't published it yet, but um, while I was still working at Safaricom, which is a telco in, in, in Kenya um, that is uh, famous for the rollout um, of M-Pesa, uh, probably the most successful um, mobile money system in the world, uh, we did a study where we tried to see what happens if you give people who come onto the net for the first time with a smartphone, and Kenya has about 50, growing towards 60% smartphone penetration. What happens if you give them free data? Right, so which means they can use the internet as much as they want, as long as they want. Um, and, you know, and free was sort of in, in different different segments, and, and we did a randomized control study comparing that to people who also come online and who don't get free data but actually have to build. And so we wanted to look at, you know, are they looking for jobs? Are they educating themselves more? Are they taking up opportunities? Is there any economic impact? So we also did a survey-based study on, on, the, on the groups that we selected through the telco. And um, the outcome of it is fascinating. Zero outcome. 
zero. So, so it reminds me a lot about the, the discussion around electricity, right? Remember, you know, electricity, electrifying was the thing to do until we somehow came to terms with the fact that just electrifying is not enough. We also need to be able to give people affordable fridges or TVs or something that actually drives consumption. And I see the same effects on the, 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 the internet. Um, so this is a study that I've been doing with my friend Tavneet Suri, who is an economist at MIT and who's been working around these things for a long time. But, but keep in mind, so, so connectivity is one thing, but, but the question that I also need to ask is, is what value are the services that we think are valuable on the internet today actually are providing for people who live in, um, you know, not in the, in, in the developing countries middle class, who live in, you know, in poverty or slightly above poverty. Maybe the same things that we value are not things that they value. Maybe Twitter is not as important. Um, or maybe some other of the services that we think are not important. And we, I, I don't think we have sufficient information about what actually provides value. And the second thing to me is, um, you know, I've been working with um, also a, a small company startup in the, in the technical and vocational training space. And what they have done is to introduce ICT into uh, training courses for um, plumbers, masons, and all that. And they build physical structures, physical workshops, where they do the theoretical part of plumbing with really interesting tools that they kind of develop in a factory, in, in, in a computer factory in India, where you have like visualizations of, you know, a pipe and how you put them in, and then you do it in practice. And they distributed these centers into rural areas in India, they're doing this in Kenya and Rwanda, and several different other places. Now you're exposing people to the internet with a very practical purpose, which is you want to get a certification as a plumber or a mason, you need to learn these kinds of things to do. And when I look at what the role of private sector in this is, we need to actually start understanding more before we think about you know, how to regulate everything. You know, what are the value services that will include those people who live in poverty, for example, in Kenya? I honestly, I've spent now the last 10 years across India and Kenya and many other African countries, I honestly don't know. I really don't know and I don't have any good indications. We love to make stuff up, right? We love to say, oh, it needs to be telemedicine because look, you have no access to a doctor. It needs to be access to water. It needs to... I don't know. So because honestly, everything that I've seen except for mobile money was a complete disaster. So, right. Kamal, let me, we, we can come back to that because Jameson has a two-finger on that. But let me, let me, I just want to check if there's any other burning questions in the room because I'm aware of time, but also to echo the fact that nobody has really conducted a, a, a major scale exercise of asking the poorest and most marginalized what they want, think, need, and prioritize since the World Bank did it 20 years ago. So it's, it's not good enough. But let's, let me just... It's not, it's not being used. I just wanted to flag that they, I think it's, you know, it's, the, it's the fact that we don't actually draw on this local knowledge that is there, you know, statistical and otherwise that is there, that would actually tell us some of these things. It is some. Right. So let me, let me put you on hold just for one second, Jameson. Does, let me take one final question. The lady over there, could I ask you to go to the microphone, please? Thank you. I'm Janet. I'm from Kenya. And I'm sitting here just to tell my friend who was indicated that Kenya we are really poor and, be, and did not get anything much. I come from that uh, part, the interior parts of Kenya. And uh, there's a lot of penetration of, of course, electricity is helping so much and solar energy. The government has done so much. And uh, what I believe is there is need for awareness and sh knowledge sharing. We believe that as developing countries, because we are also struggling with the culture aspect, we are still coming up 
very fast and very aggressive, but we still feel that uh, a lot is not shared off. I must say I'm at my 45, and I'm struggling to learn about these internet things. We are scared because the things we see there, they don't do much with our values and what we've learned since our old age. And because I have my children now, I have teenagers between 20, now coming to 20, I'm now trying to appreciate. So I think what is required is a lot of sharing and a lot of uh, creation of awareness as we absorb this. There's that divide of the age and uh, the old. And the majority now, they are coming to that age group of the age who are now in these uh, not natives in the technology age. But I believe our government is doing a lot. And I came here and I'm impressed by your comments. Otherwise, we are proud to be the pioneers in MPESA, which is really driving economy. And is, we, we, we take pride of that. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Janet. So actually, a, a question in there on digital skills and, a, and, and really interesting digital skills as they relate to data governance, which you know, it's, a, it's a whole other debate, but it's directly related to a data governance question. Let me just come back to your, your, your two-finger question, J Jameson, or your, your, your comment back, and then I'll put this back to the panel. Yes, uh, quickly. This is Jameson speaking you know, to our special advisor. Um, you know, you, you did talk about UN is a good framework you know, to look at how to have the global uh, data governance uh, uh, regime or policy. Uh, I want to ask, the, in the work stream of the high-level panel, uh, was there a consideration of the report of the CSTD, uh, Working Group on Enhanced Cooperation? Could you uh, just spell out what CSTD is? Okay, CSTD is the United Nations Commission for Science and Technology uh, Working Group on enhanced cooperation on public policy matters pertaining to the internet. I happen to be a member of that working group and they look at these things, basically. Okay, right, so a, a very specific question there for Fabrizio, a general question on, 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 on skills for the panel. I'm going to ask you also, as you answer this, can you give me, uh, we're coming to the end of our session, uh, sadly, because this is a conversation that needs to run and run, not just that it can run and run, but it needs to run and run. But I'm really interested in kind of getting very, very concrete about this. What, is, what do we need to do next? Because we can talk about it for a long time, but what is the kind of next action that we need to see happening to start unpacking this kind of, this, this, the, the, all the dilemmas that we've been talking about today? So if I could ask you, as you reflect on, on, on the the, the second round of questions, just to give me your very, in very concrete terms, what, you know, what is it that you, you want to see happen next, you think needs to happen next? Um, let me, Fabrizio, as the question was, for, there's a specific question to you, let me ask you first. Thank you. Um, I, to, to the best of my knowledge, the, the, the CSTD was, um, the, the, the findings were reviewed and it was acknowledged as a, as a best, as a very good example of a good approach, uh, if, if my recollection serves me, serves me rightly. So I should also have added in one minute, please. I forgot to add that vital detail. No, I, I think two things happen next. I think we really need to revitalize uh, vitalize the, the suggestion about regional help desks precisely to address uh, these imbalances. And, and I invite anybody who wants to join that discussion to, to talk to us. And secondly, I think we need to um, see how we can upgrade the IGF um, to make it um, uh, more outcome-oriented, particularly in this as in other areas. Thank you. That was very specific and very fast. Mariana, let me come to you. Well, first of all, uh, I'd like to come back to the idea that we should have bold plans, not just fragmented conversations on the internet, but also that we should be fostering these conversations within countries because sometimes even the developing countries are not cooperating uh, because also these conversations are not necessarily happening at the government level. And last, when we're speaking at the UN level, uh, I think we were speaking here of how difficult it is to find champions for these ideas and on, on my area of expertise, so uh, at WIPO, for example, there's a development agenda going on for a few years now, but actually the organization itself has been fostering much more of uh, the international rights, holder, rights holders agenda than the development agenda. So even in the international fora, this discussion, the, these discussions have to be more fostered around cooperations and the interests of developing countries. Excellent, thank you. Also concrete. And, and Kamal, please. 
Yeah, I think, um, you know, what I would really like to see in the future in these kinds of discussion is um, to really start thinking about a taxonomy on getting a better understanding what are the issues that we are really trying to address. We are operating in this space without a proper taxonomy. Uh, that's why we love to use examples of, you know, here, here's a startup that did something and that's the future, right? And here is Google who did something and that's not the future. It's a very sort of broad discussion where I think we need to nail this down and understand where is the way how the digital society is run today a detriment and creates more inequality and create evidence in those spaces, but also look at the sites where, where is it really positive and understand those areas because we don't want to actually over-regulate those parts okay. either. Excellent. And, and I, I'm delighted that you said taxonomies um, because um, the, the Pathways for Prosperity Commission is now coming to a close and we are exploring what comes next and we're exploring setting up uh, a centre that be based on, in Oxford at Oxford University but continue to partner with country governments and partners and academic and policy partners around the world to keep exploring exactly this kind of issue. So building taxonomies, building alternative frameworks, exploring some other possible alternative models that could be first best for developing country governments. So we'd love to stay in touch with all of you on this as we develop our, our thoughts and we explore how this is going to work. Um, I'd urge you, I've already said, there's copies of digital diplomacy by the door. I'd also urge you to pick up a copy of the Digital Manifesto, which is um, a kind of summary, if you like, of the Pathways Commission's final report, which is called the Digital Roadmap. The manifesto is the kind of the easy read takeaway summaries with 10 steps in there. So please take that away. And also, if you want to download the full report, it's called the Digital Roadmap. Um, I'd like to thank you so much for this excellent participation and enthusiasm and energy in the room around this discussion. And uh, particularly, I'd like to thank very much the panelists for joining us this morning. Can we ask everyone to please move along so we can get started? We only have an hour for the next session, so please um, take your seats and let's get going.
Okay, everyone, let's, let's have a seat. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Nelson. I'm the director for the Center for International Media Assistance in Washington, D.C. Um, I am here representing a group of people who have come together in a really, truly multi-stakeholder way to uh, talk about the future of the Internet. We represent a group called the um, uh, Open Internet for Democracy that um, uh, is composed of the Center for International Media Assistance, the Center for International Media Assistance, um, actually the Center for International Private Enterprise, the Center for International Media Assistance, and the National Endowment the, Na the National Democratic Institute. I'm, I always screw these names up every time I say them, so forgive me. But it's a group of people who come from different sectors to think about the, um, the issues that are involved in making the Internet a more open and participatory uh, Internet and, and governance process that involves people from around the world. And we are delighted that we have this opportunity to talk about this incredibly important topic today of the internet splintering into national um, pieces that undermine the, the very reason that the Internet Governance Forum was created in the first place. Um, the, as you know, this, this, this whole forum it has been going for the last 14 years that is, and trying to make the internet an inclusive and, uh, and participatory uh, process of governance that uh, values the open, connected internet that brings knowledge to isolated communities and helps um, the internet reach the far corners of the earth. It, it's, a, it's a system that um, brought knowledge and, um, and, and helped reduce poverty and help countries reach the information that they needed in order to develop and to thrive and to improve human progress. Yet today that, that internet and that vision of a democratically controlled internet through a multi-stakeholder pro process is under attack and a growing number of countries is being attracted to a, a, an approach that would create an internet that ends at national borders that becomes an instrument of social control and political suppression. So today we're gonna to be hearing the stories of how that is happening across the world and we've brought people from around the globe to talk about it. We initially had a really very good uh, gender balance on our panel but the uh, combination of no-shows and visas really undermine that, though we do have some important uh, 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 voices in this panel and some uh, important diversity in terms of geography. But I, I wanted to point out that we, we tried very hard to have a really gender balanced uh, panel and it, uh, we were, uh, we, we didn't, we, we were uh, stopped from that. So I, I'm sorry to, to report that. I'm gonna let our panelists start by introducing themselves and telling us where they're from and the organizations that they represent. And then we're going to have an, a, a conversation here at the front and we're going to involve the audi audience in that process. Uh, let's, let's start here on my, on my right. Um, Ephraim, you, you can introduce yourself and, and tell us where you're from and who you represent. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ephraim. I'm from Kenya. I work with Article 19, uh, working on freedom of expression and information across the world. Uh, we are a global organization which you've done this for the last two years uh, and uh, I'm very excited to be here so that we have this conversation to ensure that we have one united internet across the world. Thank you. Good morning everyone. My name is uh, Olga Kirilyuk. I'm uh, a CEO and founder of the Ukrainian-based organization, uh, The Influencer Platform. We are working uh, on the protection of uh, digital rights and the promotion of the idea of uh, equal opportunities, uh, free and open internet. 
Uh, during the last year, I was also the ambassador of the Southeastern European Dialogue on Internet Governance, uh, and uh, now I'm also an incoming member of the executive committee of uh, this regional initiative. And uh, also, since a few years, I'm a founding member of the uh, Internet Freedom Network for the Southeastern Europe and Eurasia. Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Walid Al Sakaf. Um, I am uh, here representing Sedatorian University, being a, a scholar at Sedatorian University's media technology and journalism departments. And um, I originally come from Yemen, so I bring expertise both from uh, uh, the north, global north, and global south. Uh, my own interests are uh, how the internet allows freedom of expression and how means of stifling the internet through censorship and other forms of re repression can, in fact, limit the potentials of the internet. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kudakwa Shaove. I'm with the Media Institute of Southern Africa, the Zimbabwe chapter. We work to promote media freedom in Zimbabwe and in the region with the cooperation of our sister chapters in four other Southern African countries. Um, we've started working on digital rights around 2015 in response to government um, actions which sought to restrict uh, freedom of expression and access to information in online environments. And I'm also here as a fellow of the Joint uh, Open Leaders for a Democratic Internet uh, Program. So just to give you a sense of the kind of work that we've been doing, we have a, uh, a set of principles that have been worked out about the open internet that you can pick a copy up out our booth that is at uh, station number 50. Uh, down in the second part of the um, open area where the uh, uh, different stalls are located. And it, we worked out the basic principles of what needs to happen in to, in to keep the, open, the internet open. And um, you might want to pick up a copy of this because I think it's a useful um, and, and practical uh, instrument to help understand what are the different, different components of that process. So today we're going to be looking first at, at the threats that come from the splinter net that is emerging in the world today and the, attractive, uh, the, the attractions that some countries are finding to the idea of closing down the internet at its borders in order to control people. Um, and I'm going to start with Walid to, to just give us a, a sense of how you see this happening, both in terms of the political uh, arrangements that are taking place, as well as the technical side of it. Um, uh, are we getting to the point where this is actually going to be possible as, as a reality on the ground? And, and what does that mean exactly? Um, thank you. Let me start by saying that when the internet came about, uh, it was a rather disruptive technology, something that governments are not used to. I mean, uh, many of you understand the decentralized nature of the internet and so the centralized control of communications through the various uh, national establishments uh, had been used to the fact that you have a center node where you get to provide permission to access the various means of communication but when the internet came about that disrupted that this, this control and so the uh, reaction was to follow to try to have a catch up uh, stage where governments look into ways in which, okay, we have no technical control of how the internet runs, but we at least have some regulatory, I mean, we can impose regulatory measures. And so uh, in many countries around the world, including, for example, in the Middle East, where I come from, national governments have control of the internet service providers. So in one way or the other, whether they are private or public, they have uh, ultimate uh, decision on whether they shut down the internet in, in a particular geographical location, uh, whether they censor it, whether they impose any throttling. And uh, we are a bit uh, further away from the Arab Spring, but we very much recall what happened at the time. So within borders, you have the ability to control access. Uh, the only thing that is a bit, um, optimal, let's say, hopeful is that there are more and more people that are aware of how one can, dis, let's say, circumvent forms of censorship through using the very essence of the technical features of the Internet. 
Then again came another wave uh, of governments reacting to this as well. So it's more to do with uh, um, um, you have a stage where you have an awareness of a new method and then you have the governments taking a step further to try and to limit the possibility of using that method. And I personally have gone through the experience of developing a circumvention software to help activists overcome censorship in certain parts, but then governments and, and others found a way to limit that access by blocking, for example, the ports of the VPN entries, and sometimes even using that in their advantage by surveilling uh, systems. So in other way, I mean, the, they see this as an entitlement being extended from the fact they are the so-called protectors of national security. So, um, unfortunately, we have trends to see uh, where we uh, realize that this is going to continue and this uh, cat and mouse chase will remain in place. There is no real one solution to how to deal with this, um, but this is a good beginning to begin to discuss why is this happening and how can we resolve it. Thank you, Wally. I want to turn to Olga now. You know, this, this area that we're working in 